Welcome to There is a Method to the Madness. My name is Rob Maxwell. I'm an exercise physiologist and personal trainer. I am the owner of Maxwell's fitness programs and I've been in business since 1994. The purpose of this podcast is to get to the real deal of what really works in health and fitness and most importantly, why or why some things don't work. Hence the name, There is a Method to the Madness. I want to first thank our sponsors, Jonathan and Lynn Gilden of the Gilden Group at Realty Pros. They are committed to providing the highest level of customer service and home sales, and they have the sales and the reviews to back them up. Give them a shout if you have any real estate needs, 386-451-2412. Today, let's talk about a highly contested subject among the runners and the walkers and the cyclists and the other people that do a lot of endurance stuff. And hey, it could be for people who are doing their daily exercising as well. But a question I got this week, and I think it's uh, worthy of a podcast, is should I be tracking my minutes or my miles, and they were referring to their running and walking that they do. And I gave them a pretty thorough but pretty simple answer back, but I wanted to dive into that a little bit because I think it gives us an opportunity to see what is going on in the body, and then we can really determine for ourselves what we want to do. If you don't want to listen any further than this one minute and 59 seconds, oh, we're now at two, then I will give you the short answer, and that is both work great. But if you want to stay afloat and listen a little bit longer and see why, because that's the name of the podcast, Method to the Madness, why can both work well, then, uh, you know, stick around a little bit. I think there's worse things you could be doing with your time. So what is the difference? Now, when we're talking miles, miles can be pretty cut and dry, pretty clear cut, pretty objective, right? I mean, if you tell yourself you're going to run or walk or do a combination of that or jog or bike, whatever. But in this case, I'll keep it to run and walk and jog just based on the distance I'm going to give. But say you're going to do three miles a day, which is a very great worthy goal for everybody. That's going to get in a lot of steps. That's going to really do the trick for most people for their health and fitness. And I think That's awesome. And a lot of people tell me they're doing that or they're doing two miles or doing a little bit more. Again, that's awesome. So if you're going to do that and say, my goal is to jog, walk, run three miles per day or almost every day, then you know that you have a clear cut end point that you're going to do. So that's very objective. Now, research shows that if you do the work, you're going to get the benefits. So overall, if you do your three miles, whether it took you, say, an hour because you were you know, taking it easy and you're doing a 20-minute mile, or if you're power walking that day and you did a 15-minute mile, so it took you 45 minutes, or if you ran it, and it took you, say, 30 minutes, a 10-minute mile, you put in the work and you are getting the same caloric burn. Now, a lot of people get confused with that, but it's a fact, minus, say, 10% difference. The reason is we basically burn about the same amount of calories per mile no matter what we're doing. So that's pretty objective. Now, when it comes to total work, and I'm not just saying work because you got to put the work in or, you know, other ways we use work. No, in exercise physiology and exercise science, we use total work in a lot of the different areas of physical fitness as in what is the total work? So oftentimes 
the way that we evaluate whether or not an exercise program is effective when it comes to cardiorespiratory endurance is how many calories are expended at the end of the workout. Now, don't confuse that with trying to overdo it to burn off more calories. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in regards to total work. So in other words, there's been a lot of studies that have shown that if you burn 500 calories in your cardiorespiratory workout, and that could be a lot. I'm not saying do this. I'm just trying to give you some numbers to help you understand. Then you really have achieved close to maximal cardio capacity that you're going to get out of that workout. So in other words, like 500 calories spent in cardio is sort of a goalpost to try to hit. So when it comes to total work, calories burned is a good indicator. And so when we're using miles, so for me, at my body weight, I burn roughly 130 calories per mile, 128 to 132, right in there, per mile. So no matter what, if I walk that mile, it's going to be right there. If I run that mile, it's going to be right there. So don't overthink this too much. Use a little bit of common sense. If I run that mile, just for simplicity's sake, it's going to take me, what, 30 minutes if I'm doing a 10-minute mile, right? If I walk those three miles, it's going to take me 45 minutes if I'm doing a brisk walk. So that's why the calories are the same. You're out there 15 minutes longer, all right? Again, plus or minus around 10%, there can be a little bit of a shift. Running and walking is a different gait. It's a different gait pattern. When you're running, at one point, both your feet are elevated from the ground. When you're walking, there's always one foot on the ground. So it's a slightly different gait pattern, and that's what accounts for that 10%, but it's still roughly the same amount of calories burned. So that is a plus or an advantage to the people that want to do miles because they know if they put in the work, they put in the work, right? So if somebody's training for a marathon and they believe based on their past experience, everybody's a little different on this. And I'm not anywhere indicating that more is necessarily better. I am simply talking about the difference between miles and minutes. But let's say a marathon runner decides that they do their best on 70 miles a, uh, a week. Yes. And they build up to that and then they maintain it. And then maybe they taper a little bit towards the end. But they determine that Roughly, they do their best running for long distance on 70 miles a week, which, yes, of course, that's a lot of miles. But when you're training for a marathon, you kind of do have to do a lot of miles to prepare yourself. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG. And we're the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. If they have a good week and they're running slightly faster for their steady rate runs, or if they have a crappy week because of stress, because of work, because of sleep, because of whatever, but they're still doing their 70 miles, I mean, at the end of the training plan, they're most likely going to be absolutely fine. So that is the, the one beauty of miles is you put in the work, no matter how you feel, you get it done, and that is a beautiful thing. All right. Now, one of the downsides to miles, and again, it, it comes down to what is best for you as long as, and I am going to get into what's happening in the body as we go, but one of the downsides to miles would be, let's say you're training with people and you ultimately want to start at the same time and end at the same time. Well, that's not going to happen if there's different fitness levels. So that's a disadvantage to miles. Let's say you get with your group of friends and you say, and you're different fitness levels and 
Everybody wants to do their best fitness pace, whatever that might be that day. So you get out there and you're going to do five miles together on a Saturday. Well, kind of maybe after the first half mile, everybody's separated a little bit. And one person might finish, you know, and gosh, they might be going quick, right? They finish in 40 minutes and another person comes in at 45 and another person comes in at 50. And then maybe a couple people are over the hour mark, you know, whatever, and maybe 75 minutes. And so you're not really able to finish and start at the same time. So... You know, that is a little bit of a bummer if you're training in a group. But if you say, you know, we're all going to do 40 minutes together and you still spread out a little bit because of fitness abilities. But then at the same time, if everybody is doing, say, a down and back run of 40 minutes, you kind of all catch each other as you're coming back in. And as long as somebody's not real wacky in their pace and you always have people that are for some reason, right? They're just a little bit wacky and like for some reason they come back like a lot slower than they went out, which should not happen if you're pacing yourself or the opposite because they're trying to show off and catch their friends. So, I mean, look, all these things happen. It's just part of being human. You know, human beings aren't always very, always, ever, never, but we're not overly objective when it comes to things. So those things are gonna happen. But for the most part, you start at the same time and everybody finishes roughly around the same time and then everybody goes and has a coffee together and they had a nice social run even though you had have different fitness levels out there. So, you know, that's where minutes is very advantageous. Another area where minutes can be advantageous is indoors because, you know, not all of our tools are overly accurate when it comes to that like the treadmill i have two treadmills i have one here at the gym i have one at my house i had another one in my garage that i recently sold and you know they're all a little bit different in their calibration so it's not overly great to rely on them for the distance i mean they're okay and if they're pretty well taken care of they'll be close but like if you ever measure them versus your sports watches, you know, where it's counting your steps and stuff. And I mean, they're really off, right? They're really inaccurate, but the watches are more accurate on the inside than the treadmill. But the treadmill's still not going to be overly objective when it comes to that. I mean, I know some people don't agree with this, but I'm sorry, you're wrong. The treadmill is easier. I mean, it just is. You have a, a, a you know, a dampened surface, you have uh, control climate, you know, th there's a lot of factors. Um, mentally, you have the pace to stick with so your mind doesn't wander or whatever. So it is easier and, and that's okay. I like both. I like treadmill and I like outdoor. But again, you're, you might want to use more time on a treadmill and just pay attention to the miles if you're a mile person. And, um, you know, if, if you're outdoors, just keep in mind that miles might be a little more advantageous for you. So that's another area and when it comes to indoor cycling especially you're not going to get a lot of accuracy at all when it comes to miles now for those that have the uh, smart trainers and all you're going to get accurate watts and all that and that's great but you're paying for that and the endurance athletes you know they know this already so really this is more for people that are thinking so should i do 10 miles on my life cycle I would say you're probably not really doing 10 miles. It could be more, it could be less. So the indoor calibration on these bikes, as much as I love them, I love a good life cycle. I love my Concept 2 bike. That thing doesn't track distance anyway, so I don't have to worry about it. I mean, I guess it does. It does in meters and watts. But that, again, is not going to be overly accurate. There's a lot of things not being taken into account with that, right? There's, you don't have to worry about headwind or tailwind, right? So... There's a lot of things not being taken into account. So when it comes to indoor, you're going to probably think more about time versus distance, all right? Now, either one could work. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're putting in the time, right? Time or distance. So if you say, you know, well, I like to do a 40-minute jog walk or a 40-minute walk every morning. 
and I know this happens to be fill in the blank with your miles, I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, really, we're like splitting hairs here. So it really comes down to what works best for you. Another potential downfall to O's tracking miles is sometimes people become like a little obsessed and into like total garbage miles. And even if they feel like crap, they're like, oh, I've got to do, you know, six miles today. And, you know, they feel like crap and they, they keep going and they, they round up their miles when they probably should have quit when they were tired. And, you know, but I don't know, is that totally a miles thing? I mean, people can do that with minutes, too. I mean, that's just, again, getting back to the very imperfect human being of not being overly rational where we're not really paying attention to signs and symptoms. So I think that can happen with either decision you make. But I will say I've seen a lot of people that think garbage miles, garbage miles. And, they, and what garbage miles means is this isn't for necessarily the everyday fitness advocate. This is more for like the endurance athlete that watches or looks at what other people do and then they think, well, I need to do that. And they go out and they just started logging miles upon miles upon miles. And a lot of it is garbage miles, meaning not done with a lot of focus, not done with any intensity, not that all miles need to be done with intensity. So again, this is a very gray area, but I have seen that where maybe people are going to be less likely to do that when they are timing themselves versus miles. You know, a lot of the scientific studies are done with time and duration over intensity and things like that. So that is a perk. But ultimately, it comes down to figure out what works for you. And maybe if there's a little slight bit of advice I would give on that would be if you're indoors, track your duration, meaning time versus your distance and by all means decide what works best for you mentally and physically because again we're not very objective so something can like totally make sense physically for you but if it gets into your head and you just feel like you're doing more work with duration or feel better about yourself with duration then use duration and vice versa but now let's talk about what really matters and that is and not that these don't matter it matters um but let's talk about like, so what's going in it on your body? Well, on your body? I don't know what's going on in your body. Let's, what's going on in your body as you are doing what I like to call steady rate exercise? So steady rate exercise, whether it be you're tracking your 40 minutes or you're tracking your three and a half miles, whatever you're doing, that's kind of steady rate. So what that means is you are at your nice aerobic level. And that's an awesome thing to reach, which is your aerobic level, meaning you have gotten through the warm up phases, you have gotten up to your pace, and you have reached what we call steady rate. And steady rate means that all of your ATP is being resynthesized aerobically, okay? That's a beautiful thing. If we raise our steady rate, like if we raise our aerobic capacity, meaning we can go faster at an aerobic pace, that means we really are improving our endurance. As I've spoken about before, you can borrow against your aerobic capacity by getting anaerobic to an extent, meaning you are going faster then you can handle aerobically. Sure, you can do that for brief periods, but you're going to have to pay that back. And that gets back into what I was talking about a couple weeks ago in oxygen debt. Not to confuse you today, what we want is steady rate in most, most, probably 90% of our workouts cardiorespiratory wise during the week should be aerobic at steady rate. And steady rate is going to be different for everybody. Like somebody who's really fit aerobically, cardiovascularly, and have strong endurance and a strong VO2 max, 
their steady rate is going to be higher than somebody that isn't. Like it could be all the way up to like 85% of their maximum heart rate and they're still really aerobic. Now, I know you're going to ask, well, how do we know? It's very hard to know that. The best way to figure it out though is with pace. If you notice that your pace is slowing down as you go and you're increasing your effort to hold it, you are no longer aerobic. So that is a pretty good indicator that you are starting to reach oxygen debt, which isn't a good thing, even in a race, because eventually it's gonna come back and stop you pretty uh, abruptly, or it's gonna be a miserable finish for you. So what's going on when we reach steady rate? Our body is resynthesizing all the ATP, adenosine triphosphate, aerobically. So you're borrowing not against any anaerobic mechanisms, all aerobically. So that is a great thing. And if we're able to maintain that for a duration, and it's different for everybody, but most people feel you've got to at least get up to the 20 minute range and then ideally longer and longer and longer. And there are a lot of studies that say that once you reach that hour mark, there's not a huge difference in improving your cardiorespiratory capacity in this regard, meaning you reach what is called the point of diminishing returns. And what that means is that after the hour, instead of like improving by 50 and 60% like you were up until the hour, you are now only improving by 5% for the whole next entire hour. For some endurance athletes that need to get used to time on their feet, or time in the saddle, they still have to do it. That's essential, that's a big part of it. But for a lot of people trying to improve their aerobic capacity, in other words, for most normal people, and I'm kidding, because I've done some real long stuff, um, you know, up to that hour is fine. But anyway, between 20 and 60 minutes, if you're doing that long enough, what begins to happen is you're improving your aerobic capacity. And the way we do that is we actually are going to get hypertrophy of the mitochondria within the slow twitch muscle fiber. I told you, I told you that the method to the madness tells you why we do things. So if we can reach a steady rate and maintain that for 20 minutes or longer, and again, that's where overload comes in. So like if you're doing 20 minutes and that's, you know, harder for you to maintain, that's okay. Next week, 22 minutes, next week, 24 minutes. But anyway, Build up until the point where you feel like you have reached the longest that you want to go cardio-wise, right? If you get over 30 minutes, I think that's a beautiful thing. That's where we would love most people to be. But by doing that and maintaining it, so everything is about stimulus versus duration. So in the case of cardio, if you're over 20 minutes, you're in steady rate, you're, you're supplying the system with what it needs. And by the way, when we're aerobic, we're burning both fat and carbohydrates. Once we reach anaerobic metabolism, we're no longer burning fat. We're in total carbohydrate burn, which is another reason why we basically just slow down and if not stop eventually. So that's what's going on there. And if we're able to maintain it, what begins to happen is the mitochondria within the slow twitch muscle fibers say, man, they're going, they're, they're, they keep going, they're going. I got, I got to adapt to this. I got to adapt. And that's why we get what are called adaptations, and the adaptation that happens within the cell is the mitochondria actually goes through hypertrophy, and that means it can withstand more oxygen at the time and burn more fat for energy, okay? So that is what happens when we put in our minutes or we put in our miles as long as we are staying aerobic. If we go anaerobic, we're getting other anaerobic adaptations but again, that should be kept to the limited, okay? So whether you're doing your miles, whether you're doing your minutes, pick what works best for you, and now I believe you have a good understanding of what happens as you're putting in the work. All right, great question. Thank you, Overhead Door of Daytona Beach, the area's premier garage door company. As the commercial says on the radio, they go up, they go down with no problems. Isn't that awesome and true? Zach and Jeff Hawk are phenomenal people. They're the owners of the company. Give them a shout at overheaddoordaytona.com. Until next time.
B Max Fit, B Max Will.